So the idea is like uh, your first place is is your home, your house, uh, and the second place uh, is your work, is your workplace. But some of the researchers uh, that I talked about earlier around social capital, one of the things that they focused a bit on are these third places. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. So I speak with a lot of doctors on this show around the topic of longevity. And generally those conversations hover over topics like nutrition and movement and sleep and restoration. And, and certainly that those are topics that you address, but you come um, at lifespan from a very unique aspect. Um, and, and, and you've, codified this in a wonderful book that I've just enjoyed called Right Place, Right Time, in which you brilliantly explore this relationship between longevity and place. Uh, and so I'll start here around the longevity piece, because we're in a sort of demographic paradox a little bit in the United States. The average life expectancy, as I've documented on the show many times now, has been actually decreasing over the past four years, while at the same time, we're seeing an increase in the number of centenarians. So can you give us a sense for the scale, like how many people are living beyond 100 and some estimates for how that cohort is going to grow over the next 30 years? Yeah, Jeff, it's it's a great question, and it's it's I've been thinking about the same thing you described, which is this kind of irony that you have this growing number of of people truly living longer. In fact, fifty researchers suggest about fifty percent of kids born today in developed countries like the U.S. will live to at least one hundred. At the same time, and this was before uh, uh, before the pandemic. Uh, life expectancy was decreasing, you know, here in the U.S., and and that's in large part because we have to look at it in in different cohorts, and you know, sadly, um, it's it's been dropping largely because of uh, the deaths of despair, as some researchers have talked about, uh, where you have the opioid crisis and and so on. That's largely been focused on um, people that are. Uh, more limited education, more limited economic means, but absolutely a very sad, disturbing cultural story that requires uh, unpacking and understanding. Um, but on the other hand, we have this these cohort of people that are breaking these boundaries in larger numbers, and those people, you know, tend to uh, be be educated, uh, better educated, have uh, uh, some resources. Uh, I know, I, I believe uh, Laura Carson, who runs the Center of Longevity at Stanford, um, the, the highest correlation they've seen with longevity is really education, but education mm -hmm. becomes a proxy for, uh, uh, for, for um, you know, wealth and income. Um, and so we're, we're at a span right now, and I don't know the exact numbers, Jeff, in terms of the percentage difference at the moment. I do know that the 80 plus courts, the fastest growing demographic. Um, we, but we do find that while that's growing, we're, as I mentioned, we're seeing these babies that are intended that in all likelihood will live much longer. But then you have, uh, uh, people in the middle, let's say in their forties, fifties, sixties, where as we, as those folks, um, uh, plan out their lives. Uh, and understand the influence of, of some of the, some of the health, uh, interventions you mentioned with doctors, but other things which we'll get into recognizing that there's, uh, lifestyles that you can embrace that have, uh, some, some say into, you know, how, how, not only just how long you live, uh, your longevity, but also what's that health span look like as well. So it's also just the, the quality of those years. Yeah, I think that you bring up a, a very important point of differentiation, this difference between lifespan and health span. So, well, average life expectancy may be pushing out what we've begun to see in significant cohorts of the population are morbidities starting to come into play in terms of chronic disease, like in, the, in your 60s. So people are living 
for 15 to 20 years in uh, a relatively sort of debilitated state, you know, with um, w- with multiple chronic diseases or, or what are, have been known as comorbidities. Um, but I think, you know, you, you make uh, an important um, point in the book uh, around longevity and lifestyle and that we are not fixed by our genetics, but that 80% of longevity, I believe, is what you say in the book, is actually linked to lifestyle, um, which I think, you know, is gives people a lot of agency. And, um, it, you know, in the beginning of your book, you mentioned the blue zones, and, and that's something that I've talked about on the show quite a bit. These are these places that where you're going to find um, the highest concentration of centenarians. So I wonder if there are some of the c- characteristics of the blue zones that have contributed to your um, keys to longevity. Yeah. And, you know, Jeff, when we, we spoke just before starting our conversation, we talked a bit about curiosity. And, um, and, and this is the first book I've written. And by virtue of just diving in and, and, and writing and reading and researching for it, uh, yeah, you stumble on a number of things that you didn't necessarily know in the beginning. And, and I've been aware of Dan Butner's work in National Geographic for with Blue Zones for a while. And I, and I think it's uh, really tremendous what they've done to put that on the radar screen of people that there are places where it's, it is. It's not just long, it's not just lifespan, it's also health span, I think is a key thing they highlight. However, um, when you look at Sardinia, for example, uh, there's inspiration there, but how do you bring Sardinia back to Austin or LA? And, right. and so I think there is a bit of a gap really to say, well, we can be inspired and there's some lessons from the seven blue zones that they highlight, but what specific things can I bring back and then infuse in my life? And, and it's, and it's encouraging, like you described, I, you know, I, I was unaware of this until doing research for the book, but there's a tendency, I don't know, you've probably seen it in some conversations with your friends or acquaintances. Uh, people say something like, well, I'm going to live a long time because my, you know, my grand, my grandfather did and my dad's still alive or, or, you know, I'm concerned about how long I might live just because there was uh, something that may have happened in my family. And while there are some rare conditions to be aware of in large part, like you described, it's, um, uh, DNA only counts for about 20% or so of, of our, of our, uh, lifespan. It really is more about, lifestyle and then physical environment and, and the two have a relationship we'll we'll spend some time on here today to talk about so it, it, it's i think it's when you look at lifespan on its own it's not altogether an encouraging story in fact there was a a, 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 a article a, um cover article in atlantic monthly i want to say 10 or so years ago jeff where one person made the case that i want to live to 75 and, and not a day longer and another person made the case, I want to live uh, beyond 75. And their conversation was really at the end of the day about health span. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's, it, it shouldn't necessarily be about how long we live, but what's the quality, you know, of these years. We don't, of course, have complete control over that, but, but there are things that we can do that increase the probabilities of it being, um, you know, higher quality of life as well as, as well as a longer life. Yeah, I think we both share a mutual colleague, friend, acquaintance named Chip Conley, and um, and Chip is trying to reclaim the word elder from elderly. Um, so, you know, typically, and Atul Gawande writes about this too in this book called Being Mortal, which is a fantastic book. Um, fantastic book. Yeah, just that... We used to look to our elders as these founts of wisdom and, you know, they really held a unique and revered role within our society. And now because of diminishing um, health span, so many of our elderly are sent off to, you know, retirement homes and we seem to kind of categorize them in this, within these brackets of, of nuisance, you know, almost. Um, and they've lost this exalted status um, of of the wisdom holder, and uh, and I think you're really trying to unravel that or disentangle that through really promoting um, design around kind of multi generational living, around increasing um, health span and not just lifespan. 
such that we can reinstantiate the elders where they belong <laughs> and learn from them. So I want you, um, you do a great, very clear job of this in the book of outlining the five universal interconnected elements that shape well-being. Can you run down those five elements? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in this, these five elements really brought to my attention through some work that Gallup Healthways has done. Um, and so the, the five areas are our purpose, social connection, physical well-being, financial well-being, and then really place in and of itself. And, and one of the, the powerful things about this, about place, actually, let me just for a moment, I'll unpack each of those for just a moment. And what we mean by purpose um, is, you know, do you have something at every stage in life that really gets you up in the morning? You know, and ideally something that is larger than yourself. Um, our researchers have found that that type of purpose is the highest correlation to personal happiness, that you have something each day that's bigger than yourself. And so that, and that's a little bit easier, uh, maybe in certain times in life. I know my wife and I, we've got, uh, got three teenagers and, and, uh, yeah. So we've got, um, got our hands full, but there's some, there's some purpose in trying to, shepherd these characters along um and uh but but different life stages and you know I've, i get a lot of purpose in, in my work and having an impact uh here but you have different stages in life and it's important for each one to be pretty thoughtful about what is this purpose in this life stage and it's hard i mean i've run into a lot you know with the book being out for a few months now i've gotten a, um, a lot of interaction now with people as they're doing this life planning and introspection and Interestingly, a number of the people that are the most financially well off are the ones that seem to be struggling the most with purpose. Um, but so, so that purpose piece is important, and then the social connection. Uh, you know, there was a lot of writing and 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 either in articles or books about a concern about the the social fabric uh, tearing apart here in the U.S. and and the sense of social isolation and loneliness before the pandemic. But the pandemic just put a spotlight on it. It made many of us experience firsthand what it's like uh, to be disconnected. And 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 the research on 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 the social connection pieces, you know, it is overwhelming. I, I, the often quoted uh, research is that um, this feeling of persistent loneliness, which is a subjective feeling, which we'll come back to in a second, you know, that has the health equivalent of smoking fifteen cigarettes a day. And so this idea of, do I, am I in a place, whether I'm introverted or extroverted, do I have uh, the, the, the uh, meaningful number of, of connections to people that both deep relationships, but plenty of more superficial ones, they all actually have value in different ways. And so how, how, how do you measure in, in that regard? And then, you know, the physical well-being, that's a bit more, uh, I think, understood in in today's world, just with the importance of fitness and movement, like you alluded to earlier. But yet, it's it's important. I remember I was part of a, a health conference uh, a few years ago in Lake Nona, and they talked mm -hmm. about how you know, the four most recent most recent Surgeon Generals, and they asked them, you know, one word of advice as you age, and and they all came up independently with the same word, and that was move. You know, got to move. So so where you know. Do you have a lifestyle that is is enhancing um, your uh, f uh, physical well being, and then and then financial well being, which is which is a tricky one because um, people are living longer, like we we've been talking about. At least a, a number of cohorts are, and so how do you plan for a hundred year life, and and what does that mean for uh, savings? What does it mean for how long you work? What does it mean for handling some of your assets? Uh, I know we're currently in these inflationary times and. Uh, I read the other day that uh, financial expert says you got to change the equation as to how much uh, you should draw down on your assets in retirement if that's a path you're on. So it's a tricky thing, and and uh, and then the fifth thing is place, and um, and, and, and the, the idea that is place uh, on its own merits uh, is it physically designed for you know your needs and desires? Do you have an emotional connection uh, to, to to place? Um, uh, and and I should say as an aside. Place can be a bit of a nebulous term, so just put some some definition around it. Is that uh, most people think of it as really your four walls, and it is. It's part of your four walls, but but when we look at it from a physical perspective, it's not just that. It's 
What neighborhood are you in? Are you in an urban, rural, uh, suburban setting? Uh, what region of the country, what metropolitan area, what region of the country, you know, what country are you in? I mean, sadly, given some of the geopolitical uh, things we're going through right now, there are parts of the world where you might live in a beautiful house and be absolutely in the wrong place. So, um, so it's really those five things, Jeff. It's purpose, social connection, physical well-being, financial well-being, and then and then place. Yeah, and it's interesting how place kind of drapes over all of them, you know. Um, and I will say, just as an aside, if if anyone wants to engage in an assessment of where they are according to these criteria. Um, I actually took the assessment on your website at smartliving360.com slash assessment. Um, I, I did pretty well, but, um, yeah. uh, but it's also in the book where you really probe uh, into some questions and, and hold people to account on, you know, on, on some of the metrics associated with this, these five criteria. And I think it's really revealing. And it was revealing actually for me where, where I came in a little bit short. Um, to be honest. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I think it is, um, really important the way that you unpack the meaning of place within the context of longevity. And, um, uh, and maybe you could pull on that thread a little bit more of how the right place can actually elevate your personal, uh, and familial well being. Yeah. And I think that might be, it might be the, the biggest idea in the book, Jeff, is that, uh, and I stumbled across it. I mean, I knew this was important. I get a lot of questions from people having been in this space for 15 or so years, but is that um, place has this really meaningful direct, like we talked about, but also indirect, like the right place can nudge you to greater purpose the night, the right place can absolutely help you in, uh, with social connectedness. In fact, that's one area that often I think people overlook is they may love their, you know, house, let's say, but they, they, they're like, wait a second. I'm actually not necessarily nurturing the, the social part of my life the way I could. Um, physical well being, um, uh, and financial well being, it has this very meaningful indirect influence. And so I, uh, as I thought more about it, I mean, there's so much we talk about, about eating right and, you know, having your leafy vegetables and, and, uh, and so on, um, and, and being active, but both are important. But I would argue that, uh, that place should be put on that same, same pedestal. It's like, if I get place right, all these other things are like, they're more likely to, to happen, uh, for me. Yeah, one of the biggest indicators for health and well-being are actually the community with which you associate, and that has so much to do with place. So, you know, as community, we hold ourselves accountable. We share some of the same habits. There's all these other. There's this field of sociogenomics, actually, how we actually exactly. influence exactly. each other's epigenetics or the expression yes. of our genes. But yes. obviously, around diet and you know, how we socialize and curiosity and creativity and interest and all these things that can be shared within a community. Um, and you touch uh, on all of those um, in the book. And I think you you categorize it with this term. And I know you didn't invent this term, but, but perhaps you can help to um, define it a bit of social capital. Um, so what is social capital? Yeah. Um, totally. And one, one thing I was going to say before I answer that, um, just back to the assessment thing for a second, I wanted to mention, and that is that, uh, when I, when I wrote the book, um, uh, I, you know, I got a lot of positive feedback on the, the dashboard you're alluding to the assessment. And I realized that some people, um, might want to dive into it without necessarily having to dive into the full book. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, added that assessment tool a few months ago, and it's been fascinating to see, I want to say a few weeks ago, we had 200 people in one day fill it out. So it's been really interesting to see people jump in and just, it, you know, it just takes a couple minutes uh, to just do a litmus test. Am I, you know, in in the right place and in, in the stage of life that I'm in? And I think that uh, part of it also is this, this acknowledgement that um, the right place for you, and maybe we'll maybe talk more about this later on, but it, 
it just may change. Like what might be the perfect mm-hmm. place for one stage of life might not be anything but that, another one, and being open to the fact that that might change and you change. Uh, but get back to your question about social capital. Um, you know, Jeff, it's thing, something I think a lot about. And and I, you know, we, we talked earlier about curiosity. Um, you know, I think that our society, we've, uh, we've, we have pretty good metrics right now to help people understand like what your net worth is or your financial capital. Uh, in some cases, uh, in times of, of uh, uh, higher, uh, greater stock market volatility, like it's been recently, you get maybe too much aware of what uh, your financial yeah. capital is. But there's these other forms of capital and, and, and social capital being one of them. And, and so social capital, the idea is that there is a real currency there's real value associated with your relationships with other people. Um, it comes in a couple of different forms. They have, um, and Robert Putnam, sociologist at Harvard, is one of the first to kind of put this on people's radar screens. I think related to uh, his book Bowling Alone came out a decade or so ago, and right. and so he there's there's one piece uh, which is described as as bonding social capital, so people you know well. Uh, would like to know better, perhaps, but it has, you have a number of things in common. And that's, uh, so your good buddies that would fit in bonding social capital. So there's, there's value there, but there's also another type called bridging social capital where you have people really from different social networks and, and there's value in having some connectivity, you know, in that area too. And so that has, it has personal value. Maybe hard to put ascribe a direct number to it the way uh, we do in sometimes the financial capital, but also has societal value. So if you're in a place, and, and we've we've been fortunate, we've lived in some places which have had neighborhoods, and in fact we live in one now that has strong social capital. Like neighbors know each other, people collaborate. There's an associative uh, culture, you know, in the area, and that just adds to your well-being on a day-to-day basis. And and so it's something it's hard sometimes to put your finger to to put a number in, but it but it's real. And it's true and and you can influence it but also but probably more often uh if you if you join one that has high social capital an area, you know, you you, you benefit from that. Yeah. Um I think you put it really succinctly in the book. You don't just care about your own kids. You care also about your neighbor's kids. And and I think it starts with that seminal question, do we even know our neighbors? And, you know, uh, I'll just speak to kind of alienation and loneliness. And you mentioned uh, the Surgeon General, you know, Vivek Murthy wrote a book about this that I know that you you talk about in the book um, as, as loneliness, as an epidemic. But when we experience alienation, or disconnection, this leads directly to addiction because we end up looking for external agents to fill a void. And we end up looking to these external agents that are inappropriate and maladaptive substitutes for this deep desire we have to be connected. But um, but we have now developed so many tools and technologies and design concepts that separate us from each other. And, um, and I wonder if you could, you know, pull on that, you know, a little bit. I mean, for example, I lived in Brooklyn for 20 years and with three young, young kids and in an urban environment like Brooklyn, like the front stoop was a hangout, you know, and that was the social milieu for a lot of people. But in the book, like you, you, specifically address like the decline of the front porch more in suburbia but how social life you know moved to the backyard it moved back behind the fence etc and you can maybe talk a little bit about maybe both how technology and how design plays a big part in fostering community or in this particular case can actually increase loneliness and separation yeah that is a it's a big topic, and it almost couldn't be more timely right now. I mean, you've got a situation. We as mentioned, we have three teenagers, and there was um, uh, there's been some recent data. Uh, in fact, it came out a week or so ago. I think in the Atlantic, Derek Thompson wrote about it, and it talked about how 
this sense, I want to say it was a sense of hopelessness that teenagers have. And, and it, you know, it's, it's part of the stage of life, right? I mean, I mean, I was a disaster. Um, I mean, I still am, but I was like more of a disaster then. And so yeah. you had a situation where I think on average, there's something like, you know, 19% of teenagers in high school have this feeling of frequent level of kind of hopelessness, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Well, in our current environment on the other side of the pandemic, it's something, it's like doubled, you know, it's, it's in the low forties. I think it's something like that. And, and so we're, and part of the explanation is this, or, or some theories anyway, are related to this disconnectedness. It's related to um, uh, some of the, the way technology has entered lives. At the same time, it's taken time away that used to be, say, on the front porch. Yeah. And, and this is a shift that's, that's happened, uh, you know, over time. Um, we, uh, we, we've been fortunate. We lived, uh, rented a, a, a duplex when we lived in San Francisco in the Presidio. And in some ways, this, this heightened my awareness of some of it because we were in a little cul-de-sac, but in a city and we had a little green area in the middle. And there were about 14 homes, um, seven duplexes that were all in a cul-de-sac. And it, and we, the homes were small. Like we didn't have much space. I think we had one bathroom. We had three kids smaller. And, and what it, what it what ended up happening was it, it forced you it, by having a shared wall, it, 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 it you know, it, 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 it and, and, and weather that generally allowed people to be outside most of the year, it, it created these serendipity connections that happened. Um, and then we uh, subsequently lived, moved to Baltimore and we lived, um, in an old neighborhood built in the 1880s where every house had a front porch. And, and larger uh, um, sidewalks and people would walk to the public school uh, in the area. And so you had, by design, you had these uh, mechanisms to just bump into people like all the time. And then, you know, you fast forward and you look at how most suburban developments were created in the 50s and beyond. We moved, we eliminated the front porch and we added uh, the, the backyard, uh, mm -hmm. typically fenced in. Mm -hmm. And, and so these, and we had the garages and, and so on. So, so those serendipity connections, uh, we, we, we lost a number of them. And then you layer in the technology, uh, piece to it. Um, it's odd now if someone rings the doorbell, I mean, we had an incident recently, <laughs> in fact, we're still, you're still working on this. Uh, our daughter had a date last year, um, uh, or this, this particular story relates to date last year and, and. And she, she's like, okay, I'm gone, guys. And we're like, what just happened? Well, apparently her date um, texted us, texted her, and the car was on the side of the house. So we didn't even see it. And so she went out and then, you know, jumped in the car. It was like, what just happened? So it's, it's, it prompted a change in our family rules, which is, hey, if someone's coming, you're going to, they're going to come, they're going to knock on the door and they're going to come in. And, and that's how we're going to roll. So we're going to, we're going to have to go a little bit old school, you know, on, on some of these rules. In, in effect, like, I think, uh, part of what I'm describing, I think Jeff is, is encouraging people to think about certain, um, like life hacks that allow us in some ways to go, go back in time where it was easier to um to have these uh knowing your neighbor and, and these serendipity connections and that might mean doing things that are less efficient it might mean doing things that aren't necessarily as popular at the moment but i think that there are some real benefits about being intentional about how do you navigate the world we're in to promote opportunities to uh you know to get to know those around you and, and, and deepen relationships yeah. I mean, we seem obsessed with uh, the scale of how many followers or likes or comments that one might get on social media versus how many people we could really call if we needed help changing the tire or, you know, picking one of my three daughters up from school in a pinch. And I think that really comes down to attention and focus and training oneself to eschew distraction. And this is where it comes into my meditation practice. And also I'm an intermittent faster. So um, I've also kind of trained myself not to crave uh, food. 
And by extension, I don't really crave my phone and I don't really crave alcohol. I don't really crave all these other vices that used to haunt me. Um, And one of the byproducts of that is that um, when I have an interaction with someone, I'm 100% all there with them. And I, to the point where it's almost ridiculous, where I can spend 20 minutes at the cash register <laughs> with the checkout <laughs> person talking about the, the detriments of too much sugar or something. Yeah. So, um, you know, but I, I do find that, you know, really committing oneself to being fully all there in their interactions ends up breeding like real trust and depth in relationship. And I've been committed to that over the last couple of years. And to be honest, this podcast really helps me because I can't be distracted. I have to be right here. And, uh, and it's been such an enhancement um, to my life because, uh, you know, I have these real in-depth conversations with folks and I feel like I really know them. And um, so, yeah, I guess that would be the hack coming from my side (laughs) would be just like be there and be all in in your interactions. And that pays back. um, I can pays back big time. Well, you're uh, you're ahead of the curve, Jeff. I mean, I think (laughs) you're talking about your ability to, to really be present and connected in a world that's you know, struggling more and more with that attention span. There was a, a article that came out a couple of weeks ago. I'm sure, sure you've seen it. Why the past 10 years of American life has been uniquely stupid by Jonathan Haidt um, at NYU. And, and it yeah. goes into these elements where we have, many of us anyway, have been so tied into and, and obsessed, uh, 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 addicted to, uh, part of it's social media. A uh, big piece is what he talks about, and and you know we did something recently. I want to share with you. We um, we have a new superintendent at our kids' school district here in in in, in Austin and uh, Austin area, and he uh, actually read, read 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 right place right time, and he's been thinking about how does he want to uh, uh, influence the culture as now he runs the school district and he reached out and we, we, uh, with, with another colleague, we did a, an experiment the other night. Um, and we did a dinner. We invited about a dozen people from different parts of the political spectrum and backgrounds and, and, uh, and brought them together just to have a conversation Beautiful. and, uh, talk a little bit about where we are as a society school district and, and just spend time together, share, share stories together. And it was, um, ironically, it was at a restaurant called The Way Back. So it's <laughs> part of what we're describing is, is taking things back to where they were. And it was, um, it was fascinating because, uh, you know, it's one of these situations where it was cathartic, I believe, for people because we just, in our current environment, especially coming out of the pandemic, people just haven't had many interactions, especially across different uh, belief systems or, or points of view and, and, but in a very civ- civil, enjoyable time. And I was like, wow, that felt good. Uh, and, and maybe we need more things like that. Uh, uh, you know, so it's not just practicing it individually, but finding ways, uh, collectively to build some practices in. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And I 100% agree. That's what we need. And you mentioned, David Brooks in the book, um, who um, he dubs a whole uh, um, group of folks that are essentially rebuilding trust as weavers. Um, So I think the the name of his kind of uh, entity is Weave, which is kind of trying to weave back together the social fabric of society and address this crisis of of togetherness. Um, And I think it, it really does start at that hyper local level, like you're discussing, um, and that like you're modeling, you know, for a whole bunch of reasons, but primarily because it's very hard to hate up close. That's a Brene Brownism, but it's, um, you know, and you mentioned, you know, just the chasm, uh, particularly socio politically where on social media, it's just an invective. I mean, there's, there's no, um, you know, there's no civil discourse there. But when you're sitting around a table, it's a whole 
different situation. Um, and you can really find common humanity and decency and shared story. Um, so I think that's beautiful. And if there's a way to model that, um, I think that's what we should, everybody listening, if they could do one thing is, you know, be a, uh, create that place that can foster um, community and understanding. I, I do a fair amount of keynote speaking, Jeff, and, and mm. there's um, a video that I've used that's actually brought people to tears. Uh, it's, it's called Eat Together. It's a video done by a Canadian grocery store. And not to spoil too much of it, but what it's a couple minutes. But what they do is they, uh, pre pandemic, but they capture uh, these two 20 um, something women and they live in an apartment complex together, a particular uh, unit. And everyone has their headphones on and they're in their own kind of virtual worlds. Would you come in and the elevator? Even her roommate uh, is, is listening to music with her headphones and probably on Amazon buying something. And she drops a bag and it's as if she doesn't exist. And they, um, it, they have this idea and they basically have a spontaneous potluck uh, dinner in the hallway. Sure, it was a fire hazard, <laughs> but they got people to stop what they're doing, join them. And, and it's a pretty heartwarming intergenerational narrative. And I do, I, you know, I think that is, it's part of what we need is just to, if more people could slow down a moment and just have more meals together, uh, particularly, I mean, really anyone, but especially if there's ways to cross friend groups a bit, I think that's when it can be even more, more powerful. We're, we're, we're at a moment where I think we're, as I said, kind of going, we have to go way back a bit to, uh, to, to reintroduce practices that used to be more commonplace. Yeah, to cross belief systems and even generations too, because I think uh, one of the things that's extremely rare to find these days are um, multi generational settings for a community. They just don't really exist very much. Um, and I'm very lucky where I in the neighborhood where I live. There's a funky little club um, that. Uh, you know, that has a food and a workout center and a pool, et cetera. It's not particularly fancy, to be honest, but it is multi-generational and you have kids running around and you have people in their 80s and you have people in middle age and they're, it's a really just unique and beautiful environment to see how everybody interacts. And yes, some of the elderly quote unquote, are curmudgeonly and they don't like the kids running around and splashing too much, but that's part of the intrigue. <laughs> it's part of the fun. Um, but, um, you know, there's a few terms that you um, uh, bring forth in the book and I, I'd love for you to um, poke at them a little bit. So there has been this concept of aging in place and I wonder if you could describe what does it mean and and when is it a good and not so good strategy for people? So part of my background, you know, Jeff, is I was in Silicon Valley and and then went to Stanford Business School and decided to really pivot into this aging field, a really longevity field. But my background through that uh, initially uh, has been on the senior living side. Now, the book, as I was writing it, um, it, its principles apply really to people at any age, but, but the focus of it is really people in the second half of life. So I think of it as kind of late forties and, and on really, uh, particularly those with kids, once the kids are launched, okay, you know, what do we do from here? I know I got some grief from, um, some, a number of friends of mine. They're like, well, Ryan, are you saying that we're, you know, middle age? I'm like, yeah, yeah yes, I am. <laughs> um, so, so I think this aging in place term tends to be a term that's more, you know, common for people more in their, I'll call it seventies uh, or so. Um, uh, but it's, it's a really, um, it's something I have strong feelings about. In fact, I have a chapter where I kind of go on a rant about it. And, <laughs> and, 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 and the reason, the reason why is I, I mean, I have issues with the term itself. Um, and I have probably greater issues with it as a strategy. Um, and the term itself, uh, you know, it, it makes aging seem just getting older, 
feel like you you don't have control it's just happening to you and then in place a gesture like this this statue you know stuck in place which you know is nothing uh, all the literature around healthy aging suggests it's about purpose and movement not being like stuck um uh and so i think so there's issues with the term um i offer some alternatives but the bigger the bigger piece i think more is around the strategy and and i think what's happened is um a ARP has done a number of uh, consumer research around it. Something like seventy-five percent or so of people said they want. I want to live. You know, I want to age in my home. I want to age age in place. And and there's a couple couple pieces in particular that, that give me concern and why I want to raise it for people as they think about it, either for themselves or loved ones. And that is the first one is um, which is one of the reasons why I created the assessment is that you may have a understandably like strong emotional connections to your to your current house um you may have um fam of course familiarity in in your house but uh oftentimes if you're really honest with yourself um you the place around you has changed and and then and then you may have changed for people that have lived in their house houses for you know for decades, and also a lot of uh, suburban homes where most you know homeowners are, they weren't designed for. It was almost as if you were never going to get old. You know, it's like you didn't mm -hmm. contemplate that at all. And so there's a there's a question around like if I'm really in focus. Going back to our conversation earlier, if I'm really focused on purpose and social connection and physical well being and and so on. Um, and, and going back to that social connection piece, uh, you know, half of older people don't know any of their neighbors. Uh, and so your neighbor, you know, neighbors can change. And then oftentimes people just pass by the house where there's older and sad, but that often does happen. And so, so this idea, are you really thriving is the question. Am I, am I really in the best place for the stage that I'm in? Uh, some cases it may mean you stay in the same neighborhood, but you just choose a different dwelling that's better fits what your needs are at that point. Um, and then the second piece is just the feasibility. And this is a big one. I mean, uh, only about less than 4% of homes uh, in the US have been designed to have universal design uh, features for people that have in some even moderate mobility issues. It's just, we didn't design homes with, with the idea that we may not be running marathons our whole life. Um, and then, uh, then as we think about uh, like health needs we may have, it requires any care that we need to have to come to us. And that is inefficient and it's expensive. And in today's labor environment, if you're having a hard time getting a gardener, you know, good luck trying to find, you know, home, uh, home care aid. And, 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 and so, you know, and then, and even this fits a bit more onto the, um, well, there's also a financial piece of it. I mean, I think that if people think about what really are the costs of your of maintaining your house and what that means for your financial well being, um, and one thing I, I I do mention in the book that I think some people overlook is people have uh, equity a lot of times who are older in their homes that it, that has has grown over time. But if they were to take that equity and and then invest that in other vehicles that are more diversified, um, they're going to have a, 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 I would say, a safer, higher return than having a lot of their assets in, in one place that could be impacted by climate change or, uh, you know, their, or their environment, their neighborhood could change and it could be harder to get a higher price or even sell at all. So I think that a lot of people say, I want to age in place, but they actually haven't thought through mm -hmm. really what's involved in that. And I, in some cases, if you have lo loved ones in this situation, they haven't thought through it. That's their plan. And, and, and then that can be harder because in some cases over time, something happens, like life happens, and then you may be ill-equipped then to, to handle something that either healthcare, health event or something else that then requires like an immediate urgent change. So I, I just, I, I do, uh, as I said, beat up aging in place a bit, but I, but, but I do think it can be the right thing for different, for people at different stages but it's very rarely the right thing across all life stages. And the more that people lean into understanding there could be another better right place for me, I think the, the better off individuals will be, but I think also, also our society. Yeah, I think you know what you really encourage in the book is for people just to be thoughtful and to do some real self-inquiry around it 
you know, for example, one can get very emotionally and irrationally connected to their single family home, you know, and like you say, you could have a ton of equity tied up into it. Um, but that's not very liquid per se. Um, so you might get kind of caught there and then, you know, can you really manage the upkeep and constant drone of repairs, et cetera, that are often associated with a single family home? Um, you know, do you want more flexibility? Do you want more walkability? Um, you know, there's so many factors that go into it. And I think, you know, what you're saying is there's not necessarily one right answer, but there is a process um, in which one can engage to be more thoughtful about it. And, you know, for example, I'm 51. So my parents are thankfully both alive, but, you know, they're, my dad's 80, 80, and my mom's 79. And um, so I'm thinking about it more in terms of them, you know, um, and, uh, and also a little bit in terms of me, because I also have three daughters, well, I have three kids, mine are daughters and they're all teenagers. And my eldest is going off to college next year. So I'm beginning to confront the reality of like, okay, well, you know, what is going to be optimal for me going forward? And, um, and it's not that I have to decide right away, but just to start to engage in some thoughtful um, processing around it is, is a great, great move. And I think that totally, and I think that is uh, part of what the, the book implores. And, and what I'm trying to do more broadly with Smart Living 360 and the work that I do is this decision matters and doesn't mean you should wake up tomorrow and change your life but although some people might do that, I've got a couple of funny stories where that's happened. Um, but I do think it's like, hey, yeah, like think about it and recognize that there are different stages and am I on the right stage for different things? And, you know, you mentioned earlier, there may not be any one right place. And I agree with that. But, but I would also say objectively, there are plenty of wrong places. <laughs> and if you're in your single family home and you love it, but you don't see anyone every day, that's that's probably the wrong place. And, and going back to our, uh, some of the dialogue we had around social connection and, and loneliness, but also just the ability to, to physically interact with people. Um, so I think it's, it's, uh, and, and a couple of things too is this is a little bit more forward looking. I have a couple of chapters where I look at where is healthcare delivery going mm. and also where is technology headed and, and our homes are going to be increasingly shaped, I believe by the ability to have health services kind of come to us and help all, help really our homes keep us healthy and also with technology, uh, ways in which technology is going to be more integrated, hopefully in different passive ways. So we're not all you know, glued to the screen, but passive ways to make our you know lives better. And so if you're in a house that isn't set up very well for some of those changes in, in health and, and technology, that that alone you know, might, might trigger thinking about other options, particularly if there are attractive ones, you know, that, that might be available. Yeah. You talk a little bit about this movement in city design called walkable urbanism. Um, can you explain what walkable urbanism is? Yeah. So some of the scholars have done work in this, they, uh, they call, they call them walk-ups. Mm -hmm. And, and what, in effect, it's taking some elements of what we might think of smaller scale, but thinking things of, uh, well, going back to your life in Brooklyn, which had a lot lot of walkability. What are some of those elements that can be incorporated in other cities, but also the actually area that's grown the fastest is really in suburban areas. So we, can we create like walkability, um, areas in design? Um, and, and it's, it's pretty simply, it's just, can we create, can urban planners, can developers, uh, policymakers make it a little bit easier to create housing that allows through walkability, um, you know, for you to easily get to a number of things that matter, whether it's groceries, whether it's pharmacy, uh, whether it's your job, you know, things like that. There's a, there's a, another similar, um, uh, concept called the 20 minute city. Yeah. And it's like, can you get to these key, kind of 
things that you often would go to, again, groceries and so on, within 20 minutes without necessarily a car. Uh, and so it could be bus, it could be rail, it could be walking, um, it could be biking. Some um, I've I've had a bike, I've biked uh, jobs uh, throughout my career. One of the interesting things that's happened is, and they're a little expensive, but I, I expect them to go down over time. Are these e-bikes? Yeah. And 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 my wife deserves credit for this because. It, it, to me, it struck me as a little bit superfluous, but she uh, eventually broke me down. And so it was her birthday last uh, last October. We bought an e-bike, so she cruised around. I, I like to bike, but it's pretty hot in Austin. And uh, I'm often a bit overheated on the other side of my bike if I'm doing errands or whatever. But with these e-bikes, you're seeing more and more of it. Uh, not just, you know, can rent, all, rent on the hour basis here in Austin, but more people just picking them up. And it's interesting when you do the 20 minute city idea, um, it, 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 take some places like we live in a more suburban area, like our walkability score wouldn't be uh, through the through the roof. But when you throw in um, the, the e-bike ability, we can get to all sorts of places in 20 minutes. And, and so I think that uh, the multimodal uh, transportation options are things that people should be thinking about as well. Like, okay, well, if I am in this neighborhood and I have an e-bike or some other things, what now becomes more accessible to me than if I were, you know, more of an ex-urban location or wherever your current alternative is. So it's, there's, there, it's, it's an interesting way of, of looking at how your life can be constructed on, on a daily basis. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think there is this romantic notion of having this, you know, single family home with a picket fence and its own sprawling property, et cetera, which, um, you know, is very tantalizing and has been kind of put on this pedestal of the American dream for a really long time. But if you really examine these criteria of what it means to be well, and if you find that social connection is a significant component of that, well, then I think, you know, you, you just need to readdress some of these tropes or ideas. And, you know, so for example, if we're talking about the 20 minute neighborhood or walkable urbanism, well, that's going to require a certain amount of population density. Yep. Um, because it, you're not going to have that with, you know, two acre single family home lots. So if you're looking for more connection and more hyper locality, I think, you know, again, you have to go through this self-inquiry process of like, okay, well, that's going to mean I'm probably going to be living in a different kind of situation. Is that in a mixed use kind of situation or is that in a duplex situation? Is it a little bit more urban? Um, is it a little bit more kind of metropolitan, et cetera? So I, I think, you know, this, it's, it's um, I think what you're asking people to do is some real thoughtful inquiry that pushes them out of their comfort zone and what might be considered sort of the kind of, you know, typical American dream, if you will. Well, and it's made a little bit more complicated because uh, in situations with couples, uh, at least in, at least in my relationship, it's, it doesn't, uh, what, what I perceive as most important isn't always what we collectively <laughs> perceive as most important. So, you know, you have your, you know, interests and preferences and they have to layer those in with your partner and, and how do those kind of web together. And, and I go to, to great lengths, uh, I'd be curious to get your take on this, but I go to great lengths to try to be Switzerland mm -hmm. and, 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 and lay out the pros and cons of, of, of every, situ of every situation. And so I lay out the research around, you know, intergenerational uh, connectivity and some of those arrangements, but um, but there's strong arguments for why age restricted housing is 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 a popular choice. In fact, the uh, the most successful master plan community I think ever is uh, the villages in Florida, and mm -hmm. and again, that might be for you. It's not for you, but like at least evaluate what the pros and cons are. You know, for these um, you know these different different options, and he, there's some counterintuitive things too, like. If we're talking about social connection, well, in a rural environment, rural town, uh, in theory, it should be. If you look at just population density, you'd say, "Well, this this must be uh, must be the hardest to actually get to know your neighbor." But research suggests people in these rural towns actually um, they do know their more of their people on a percentage basis because there's people have to often associate 
in certain ways for the needs of their, you know, of their community, or they maybe have had roots for a long time, you know, in, in that place. Uh, on the other hand, uh, people can be quite lonely in a dense urban environment where you've got this sense of anonymity, you know, there. And, and so it's, um, you know, one thing I do talk a little bit about is I, uh, I, I take, uh, uh, the design thinking, uh, principles, uh, which is kind of a fancy word for, uh, just using the scientific method of, of what do I think might be true and testing it out and then learning when you test it out. But it's a, a term, a lot of now innovative companies, Apple, you know, others, uh, Stanford has a design school. They, they call it the D school related to this and they have more of a formalized process around it. But the thing about place is when you're making big decisions, uh, like if you decide to sell your house and move somewhere else or relocate to a new geography, those are, they're big deci- decisions. And sometimes, most times, almost all the time, they're irreversible. And so you want to, there's some wisdom in thinking about it, like we've talked about, Jeff, but also like trying something out before you decide to go uh, whole hog and then and then then find out that what you thought was true, you know, wasn't. And now, like, you know, what do you do about it? Right. Yeah, I suppose Airbnb and gives people a little bit more optionality or short term optionality of like, hey, I'm going to go see what it's like to live in the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, it, it sounds great. It, West Coast is generally rates very, very healthy. But, oh, man. It just rained too much. So, you know, or whatever. You know, it's funny. Well, speaking of the Pacific Northwest, I used to, I did, when I was in the music industry, I did a lot of work with Starbucks. And, um, and while I was there visiting in Seattle, I was introduced to this concept called the third place, um, which you mentioned in the book a little bit. Can you define? Uh, the third place and how it is useful for fostering connection. Yeah, I'm pretty envious, Jeff. Not only of how much reading you're doing, but your reading comprehension. I feel like you, uh, you, you, you may recall more about the book than I do. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so third place, uh, you know, it fits into that social capital conversation we had earlier, and it, it's, it's something that I, I. I, um, well, let me define it first. So, so the idea is like, uh, your first place is, is your home, your house. Uh, and the second place, uh, is your work, is your workplace. And, and particularly when, um, well, and, and the idea, particularly before a pandemic period was that you really, a lot of your world just circulate around these two different places. Um, but some of the researchers, uh, that I talked about earlier around social capital, one of the things that they've focused have been on are these third places. Where do people, and Jane Jacobs and others have done some good work here around, um, where are these like places that people, they just naturally are drawn to and aggregate where it creates, uh, uh, no one necessarily owns the space per se. But they're, you're welcomed and you have these interactions. And so those three places can be parks, they can be libraries, they can be cafes, they can be workout facilities or clubs like you referenced in your life. Um, and, and, but it's important that they're uh, convenient to get to. It's not uh, a, a, a long chore, a long distance to kind of get there. And it, it encourages, you know, frequent interactions in, in, in our, where we live in uh, stats at Austin, the closest thing we might have to a third place, it, fittingly enough, here in Texas, uh, particularly in the fall, are the are the Friday night football games, yeah. and and there are thousands that show up, and it's it's not just the parents of the kids that are playing or or some of the students. You know, you get people of all ages that are there and enjoying a game, enjoying some some time at night and cheering, and you just bump into people. So that would be, you know, an example, a uh, localized example of that third place. But it's so, so one thing to think about if, if third place is, is important is some places have more third places per capita uh, mm-hmm. than others. Um, you know, one, one article I saw recently by Joe Coughlin, who runs the age uh, MIT lab, um, he, he uh, was wrote an article making the case for, uh, for pubs. People need to spend more time in the pubs, and he reminded me that um, pubs are a short word of meaning public house. 
this idea that uh, that yeah. third place where you, you know, it's like cheers, you go in and everyone knows your name. So <laughs> yeah, that's what third places are. And I think they, they, they can have an important role for people. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, I know that you mentioned, I think it's the AARP, but also the Milken Institute has, um, has a, a focus around aging and they both did separate studies where they analyze cities and towns for livability. Um, I wonder if you could kind of, uh, enumerate some of the most livable cities and towns in the United States and how they actually relate to education level and, and health, et cetera. Yeah. And it's tricky because each of these places have their own kind of rubric and weightings. You know, it's, it's, I know you have a daughter, it sounds like going to college next year and we have uh, some of them knocking on that door. And so you have like the U S news and report or, you know, the, their studies and they have their scorecard. And so everything's, uh, you know, so some colleges look like this, other colleges look like that. So it's a similar thing with place. Like you have, you know, what I encourage people to do is effectively create their own rubric, but it's helpful for, to see some work that other people have done and, and how do they get there. Um, one of the interesting things with the Milken Institute uh, study, the most recent one around place is they have, um, uh, they, I think they break it up by by size of of cities. So you've got like large cities and medium sized cities. So it's ways to slice it that way. But the Midwest is overrepresented in in their work. Um, I was just in uh, Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan yesterday, and I was and I was um, flying back. And you'll you'll find this kind of funny. I was flying back, and it was a uh, uh, a crew that was from based in LA, but they work in the Grand Rapids flight and they were making comments as just how friendly people were on this <laughs> Grand Rapids flight. Yeah. And, and so I think in the Milken Institute one, they do talk a bit about um, this, the, 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 the kind of kindness and social capital elements that are a little more common in, in parts of the Midwest uh, that are there. So that's, that's a piece I know with the, the ARP one, um, you know, they factor a bit more in uh, just some of the the, uh, the like cost of living is is a bigger piece, I think, in their studies. So right. um, it really, you know, it's 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 a range. I think that um, uh, one thing I think it is important to say, though, is that there and I, I don't know um, this is mentioned a bit, I think, in those studies, but I do take a moment in the book to talk about region and state. And you alluded to this earlier with how we're influenced by those around us. And, and there is a perva uh, pervasive culture that we get impacted by. Like if our friends' friends are obese, we're more likely to be obese. Yeah. And, and I found, you know, uh, by a suit, and if your friends' friends are more healthy and active, you're more likely to, to be that way. And I know moving from the, the East Coast to, to Texas, we've been having more beer and tacos, you know, that's uh, part of what, what happens associated with it. But you do find places, I'll pick on Louisiana and, and Illinois for a moment. Like Louisiana is a place where um, it's, it's just not a very healthy state and, and there are more food deserts there. And it's, and it's, I love New Orleans, but it's a harder, it, it, that, that state has some things that make it more challenging, you know, in terms of, in terms of aging. And then Illinois is an interesting one because You've got a place where when you look at the financial health of the state, it's got pension liabilities, it's got aging infrastructure, you know, it has, um, you know, unions control, uh, have a lot of influence in some of the decisions. Um, and then and the weather, you know, isn't necessarily what everyone's looking for. So when you're playing it out and you're older, say in Illinois, there's some reason to be concerned about what does the fiscal health of that state look like, and if if a younger population decides to you know relocate to other places, just what is that? Um, what is the demographic uh, uh, layout of the, of 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 the state look like in terms of ability to get uh, uh, workers or help when you need them, or even fiscally, like as 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 uh, companies. Uh, relocate to places where it's less expensive, less regulatory oversight. Um, and then, um, you know, you just have less of a tax base to fund some of, you know, that's happening to a lesser degree in California, but it's a, in Illinois, it's a little more profound. So you, these are things to think about when, when you're trying to find the right place. And because people are living longer, going back to how we started this conversation, the core of people, they're educated, 
uh, and have some resources that are and are motivated around these lifestyle choices. I hate the word retire. Um, and and, and our, our mutual friend uh, Chip talks about not retiring from, but retiring to. What are you going to next? Um, but I do think you you know you might let's say you decide to change gears in your mid sixties. What is are you in a place? What's it going to look like thirty years from now? You know, those are some real questions, and and you might find that your place, uh, uh, it, you know, turn it makes a turn for the worse over that period of time, and that can create some challenges. Yeah, as, as people are doing this assessment of place, is there any correlation between climate, sunlight, and nature uh, with healthy aging? Well, there definitely is, uh, and I know in, in the the chapter on on health goes into that a bit, like some of the research around being able to have like access to not not you know not just access to nature, but even just visually seeing it. You know, I'm 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 fortunate we're in my home office right now, and I I'm, right now I'm probably looking at at least a dozen trees that are mm-hmm. around me, and and again, part of it just having that natural sunlight. That's available. Like those, it, um, they they matter, you know, o- o- over time. So the ability to be part of it or have access to it, um, it, it is, you know, it, it, it does matter. And and I think that you're you're seeing. Uh, there's a group actually that's um, f- focused on uh, uh, certifying places. Uh, a couple of them actually are working on this. Um, Delos. They have something called the Well Standard, and they look at quality of light, quality of air. Uh, uh, you know, the, some of the building materials you use um, to get a sense of how much is your built environment, given that we spend north of 80% of our time indoors, factoring in sleeping and so on. Like, is 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 the place I am, a uh, place that I'm in on a regular basis, is it nudging me to live healthier or, or not? And so that that's another another thread to be thinking about um, when you, when you're choosing your place. Yeah, in fact, last week I just published a lengthy podcast with a doctor named Roger Schwelt where we go uh, profoundly into the benefits of sunlight as it pertains to, um, well, obviously vitamin D, endogenous vitamin D development, um, but, uh, but also in setting your circadian clock such that certain hormones are released at the right times of day. And that can obviously enhance one's ability to get a good night's sleep. And there's so many reasons that sleep is important for healthy aging and longevity, but also sunlight, uh, infrared light specifically, um, stimulates, um, antioxidant production in the form of mitochondrial melatonin, Hmm at the cellular level to fight oxidative stress or free radicals that are a product of of just cellular respiration. So there's a whole bunch of reasons that sunlight are really important. And he did this whole analysis, this correlation between COVID mortality and sunlight. Hmm. And it was fascinating. Just uh, his focus was started uh, analyzing data from the US, but then went around the world and 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 saw how um, detrimentally impacted people were that did not get enough sunlight as it pertained to severe COVID contraction or mortality. So anyways, it's, it's another thing to, to put into the equation as you're uh, assessing, you know, where, you know, where do you want to live? Where do you want to spend the rest of your life? Yeah, it's you, yeah, it's fascinating the people you're able to speak with. Jeff. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'd love to. It sounds like that's a podcast I need to internalize. Um, I think that it, it is. Um, uh, there's a lot. There's a lot to factor in, you know. And I and, and I think it can be overwhelming. And 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 I think that's it's an important piece of this. And that is to say that um, I, I think I introduced it a bit. Uh, I, I studied engineering in college, and I remember this physics class that like. I survived, but barely, and we had a final <laughs> test. And I, I like working with real numbers. And the final question on the final test had, I don't know, the whole Greek alphabet. And it was just overwhelming, just calibrate. What do I do where? And they can feel like this. Like, well, how much should I think about sunlight? How much think about knowing my neighbors? And what can I afford? And and so I think part of it is, is taking a step back and just saying it matters. It matters, mm-hmm. but don't let uh, good enough get in the way of, of uh, or perfect get in the way of good enough or better. 
Yeah. And and I think that that's uh, you know if you're in a spot where there's gaps relative to where you'd like to be, um, acknowledge those. And I find in most cases, as I've interacted with more people with the book, that in most cases it it doesn't mean that you move. In most cases, it means that you reorient how your relationship to your current home. Um, and there's a bunch of simple things. I mean, we talked earlier about. Uh, bringing people together to have dinner. Well, that's there's ways in which you can re-engage perhaps with your neighborhood and community that you just haven't done recently. There can be smaller things like uh, painting a wall or some walls of a room, rearranging the furniture that can make it feel different. It could be, you know, we've done this. We have a little bit of a front porch. We just invest a little bit more in having a comfortable couch out there. And, yeah. and so now we're more likely to interact with people. So um, and you mentioned earlier, just moments ago, about sleep and how important that is. Even even simple things like, okay, I'm going to be more intentional about putting the devices elsewhere, or maybe if we had a TV in our main room, maybe we put that in a side room. So there, you know, there there are places where you can where you can improve just where you are in some of these measures. It doesn't require this like wholesale change, um, although some it does, sometimes it does. And in some cases you can make some modification to the current environment while you're also thinking about what, what, what perhaps a future stage could look like. Yeah. Yeah. One of the biggest takeaways uh, for me from the book is, is exactly what you just alluded to, which is that there are so many criteria that go into choosing the right place. But in the end, when it comes to place, you you get out of it what you put into it in many cases. And you have this quote, and I wrote it down because I, it really was resonant um, from the poet and environmentalist Wendell Berry. And if you don't mind, I'll just read it just for a second yeah, because I, I just thought it was, there was an emotionality to it that I just was like, it really kind of struck me, and this is kind of towards the end of the book, and I'll try to stay on mic here. But, um, and so I became to belong to this place. Being here satisfies me. I have laid my claim on, oh, sorry. I don't know if I wrote it right. I've laid my claim on the place, and I have made it answerable to my life. Of course, you can't do that and get away for free. You can't choose, it seems, without being chosen. For the place in return has laid its claim on me. It has made my life answerable to it. That's just beautiful. <laughs> oh, I got goosebumps. So I, um, it's funny, I had a call earlier, earlier today and we we're talking about Wendell Berry. You know, it, we can make it complex with all these variables, um, but there's a flip side of it, which, which, uh, which that quote gets to, which is, and, and I, I tell you, this is something that I aspire to have which is if you have such a strong connection to place, the decision has been made. Hmm. Uh, and of course, Wendell Berry, he's written a number of novels. Jaber Crow is one of them. He, he kind of get this feeling through that, that narrative of that connection to place. And I think that uh, I've seen it in some of my conversations. One of the things that's come up recently is, and I don't think I alluded to this directly in the book, but are you a anywhere person or are you a somewhere person? And the idea is anywhere, you could live almost anywhere, um, just find that place, but you could pick up and find other place. The somewhere per somewhere place, which Wendell Berry describes is like, no, 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 I am here. This is me. Mm -hmm. I've run into increasing number of people who are anywhere people in search of becoming their somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like I could literally, but where I want to go to a place and, and, and get rooted in, and my I don't say this directly in the book, but I certainly feel for my circumstance and, and my, my wife, wife's as well, that we love the idea of having a strong connection to the hyper local, but yeah. but we'd like to make sure it's, the, it's within degrees of freedom of being the right hyper local. Mm -hmm. And, and we change places change. I think that's one of the things that struck me in, in thinking about and writing the book that you might think you've you're grounded in this one place um but it can change around you and so that does test the commitment of you to that that rudeness to the place uh but it's a um, thank you for sharing it because it's a it, my favorite chapter is the conclusion you know sometimes you wonder how many people get to the conclusion but it was exactly that line of thinking that really like spoke to me as i was writing it yeah yeah beautiful well ryan i so appreciate 
um, your work and all the thinking that you're doing behind the work and, uh, and the time that, that we had today and, you know, just a window into a, a little bit what I've been thinking about in, in terms of longevity and place and blue zones. And I've been thinking a lot of like, how do we all engineer blue zones in our own communities? And what are the keys to being able to do that? And so I've been thinking a lot about that around how can I instantiate some of the criteria that we've talked about today in the place where I already am such that I can add to its thriving. And um, yeah, this has been a, a, an illuminating conversation and a, one that I hope that we can continue to have. Yeah, I've so enjoyed this, Jeff. And just to put an exclamation mark behind what you just said, I think that Blue Zones has been fantastic to put a spotlight on how place matters, but it, it can leave you hanging a bit because not many of us are going to move to Sardinia. <laughs> uh, and so the question becomes, how can I bring elements of that where I am? And as you just pointed out, particularly in the areas of like social connection, your effort to reach out to others influence not just you, but the other people you touch. And so there's, there are beneficiaries beyond yourself around cultivating a blue zone, you know, in your own neck of the woods. And so in a way, this book and, and some of the, the uh, practices I um, elevate is encouraging people to create their own version of blue zones, you know, in their life in where they currently are. Hey, I'm glad you enjoyed this video. We have conversations with today's top thought leaders every single week. So make sure you click the notification bell below so you don't miss our weekly videos. I'll see you soon.